I'd like to introduce you to Out of Zion, Meeting Jesus in the Shadow of the Mormon Temple, written by Lisa Brockman. And she was our guest last time, and we're going to talk more about this book. One thing that I was impressed with as I read through this, and I, I don't want to really take a lot of time, but I, I was so, so interested in the way, and I don't know that you meant this exactly as you wrote it, but it started making me think as a former Mormon, more, former Latter-day Saint, however they want to be called mm -hmm. these days, the pride that I had mm -hmm. in my Mormon life. Mm -hmm. And I just made a list of things as I read through here. We have such a pride in our family. Yes. And you mentioned your five generations. I was a multi-generational. I'm proud of that. You know, and probably, probably had polygamy. Did you in your in your family? Did you? I don't you know? know that we had polygamy. We did. I was proud of that. My, proud of my testimony. Mm -hmm. I was proud of being in the, in the only true church. Mm -hmm. Right. Paying my tithing, fasting, baptism, wearing garments. There was a source of pride there. Mm -hmm going through the temple and knowing I was to make the celestial kingdom, that the church was unique and that we had a modern, modern revelation and a prophet, um, that I lived my life and I was making points in heaven all the time, that I kept the word of wisdom. That, that was I, a big one. Was it? Yeah. I think. Like yeah. every time we'd go out the to pride, eat. The pride of that. Oh, I would just like... and. I, the way it would manifest, because I was a child, so it's not like I was an adult doing this myself, but I think I would have. Like my parents, if we were ever given a wine glass, they would just put it aside. We don't drink wine. And make and a there point was, of that. Yeah, and there was a pride in that. There and I is. just think it, it's a natural outflow of our doctrine and culture as yeah. a Mormon. I know, and just a couple more. But our reverent worship and sacrament meeting, and you mentioned yes. the, your time in the other church, and uh, just our our divine nature and our education, our professions. You know, we're very proud of mm -hmm. what we've accomplished, and our it's all about us. Yes. And what we're doing, this divine nature that we were talking about before, and then we find out we have a sinful nature. Right. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> but what's interesting, I think, about this list is that. I don't think we would ever have said it's all about us. We would say it's all about the Lord. I think you're right. We would never have said it's all about me. Yeah. Like there's somehow a way of We've couching it in it humility. Over that or something, yeah. That um, <laughs> it took me wrestling through my doctrines to see, wow, I'm very arrogant. There's no brokenness in me. No. No I know, brokenness I in me. I know I'm not perfect. But I'm not broken, or I, I mean, I, yeah. it's just funny how we kind of, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, as I went through the book, and tell us about the book. Tell us how it started, and and after you had shared with with us how you'd turned your life over to Christ, and mm -hmm. um, and is there a maybe a moment after that that uh, how you manifested that, or did you? Well, when I after I trusted Christ yeah. and. Um, walked into God's kingdom, the biblical God's kingdom that day. The next 14 months were a season where God began to expose what I call my idols, boys, tennis, um, alcohol, things that I was looking to for satisfaction, for life, for peace, for escape, all of that. Um, God he, started breaking. God the started to expose them for <laughs> yeah. what they were, and so I was still partying on the weekends, like I had for the last, the previous year. But suddenly there was there was a remorse the morning after, and what was so striking to me is through that season, I began to want to stop drinking. I knew as I read the Bible, do not get drunk with wine but be filled with the spirit that God desired his spirit of love to occupy me completely. And I wanted that. And so there was this war within me, which the apostle Paul makes so vividly clear. I became very in tune with that war in my soul, but I couldn't stop. 
I was very much surrendered to this way of life, to these sin habits in me. And so what was so, I think, stunning to me throughout that 14 months is I would resist and resist, and then on the weekends give in. I did not have the willpower. My will was not strong enough to resist. But every morning after, Jesus was with me. And as a Mormon, Jesus was not with me. Yeah, God leaves, the Holy Spirit leaves when we don't do what's Yeah, what's right. and like his comfort, his withness, his presence was with me. He was with me in the bars. He was with me everywhere. And that withness, that incarnation of his love was revolutionary. And so for 14 months, I still partied, but... Nine months after I trusted Christ, about my boyfriend took me to a campus crusade for Christ meeting at the University of Utah. Mm. And I was like, what is that? I'd gone to church with him, and that felt like putting someone else's skin on. Like, that was so uncomfortable. And I knew I wanted to worship in this Christian church, but women were wearing tank tops and jeans, and people were playing in bands. and everything just felt like somebody else's clothes are on me. Like, I don't know how to get comfortable here. It was really hard culturally to make that shift. Yeah. So that was going on. We were still drinking and he took me to this campus crusade meeting and they did not meet Mormons who came to the biblical Jesus back then much ever in the eighties. And they were like ticks on a dog, all these stuff just pursuing me, wanting me to get followed up, grounded in my identity in Christ. Who am I now as a Christian? So yeah. that happened. And then I decided I'm going to break up with Gary. Gary and I were coming to the end of our relationship and I really wanted to walk with the Lord. And I knew guys were this addiction in my life that I'd look to for identity. Mm. And so I broke up with Gary. And again, like my flesh was so weak. I started dating this other guy, Mark, who was a football player who didn't know Christ and wanted nothing to do with God. So there's me working really hard in my flesh to stop, like stop it. And I couldn't, I was very powerless. And so about over the next five months, God just gave me such a deep hunger for another kind of life where I was he's just ever patient. Where I, he's so patient yeah. and so with and so it was my 21st birthday. I was going to not go out and drink. I was not going to go party. And my girlfriends came over at about nine o'clock at night and we went downtown to the port of call bar and I consumed large amounts of alcohol, <laughs> like eight beers, six shots. And I didn't get a buzz. And I had a big, huge tolerance always, but I always managed to get very inebriated and couldn't even get a buzz. So I needed to be present all night long there and gross guys were picking up on me. My girlfriends were throwing up over urine soaked floors. And I was like, you this, started seeing this for Oh, the emptiness. Yeah. Like it had brought me life in some way. And now it was like death. It just was death to my soul. And I went home and I laid down on my bed with my fists clenched and I just gave every addiction to God one by one in tears. And I was like, you have to take this away, this desire, this desire, clean my mind. I just went down the list and then I fell asleep. And the next morning I woke up, it was December 21st and God had done a heart transplant, <laughs> like a brain transplant. I was a different person. I knew the chains are broken. And so oh, it was remarkable. Mm -hmm. Like my soul was set free. The yeah. power of surrender. And God is, like we said, so patient, knowing yes. what's down the road for Lisa. Yes, yeah. so patient. And you met uh, Dennis. In the well, yes, I had, Christ. yes. I had gone, I had not gone to any Campus Crusade meetings that fall of my junior year. I had not yet surrendered. And there was a staff woman who was chasing me around campus, trying to disciple me. And so occasionally she would catch me and we would talk and do a little Bible study. But I just wasn't at a place where I was hungry enough to, um, and willing to surrender all my addictions. So anyway, but I remember it was about November of that 
year and it was a month later that was my 21st birthday when I really oh, just gave okay. everything to Jesus and I sat with Lisa and she said I think you should consider telling your family you're a Christian and I just felt like she punched me in the gut I'd shelved that like never I don't no. like I can't go there and um, uh, I remember just sitting there about ready to throw up that whole conversation and she handed me a piece of paper with a phone number and she said this is the number of our campus director Dennis Brockman I want you to call him he said Brockman. he'd be Brockman <laughs> oh. so he as in the book Lisa Brockman um yeah so he gave me an invitation to call and he just said I'll help walk you through this and um I called him and after about 45 minutes on the phone, I had a crush on him. I was like, I was Hadn't just even such <laughs> an idol factory. Yeah. No, I'd never met him. He had just come to campus that fall to direct. So, no, he was nine years older than me, and I'd never met him. So I was like, I want to go to a Campus Crusade meeting and meet this guy that I have this crush on. So that week, I took him pumpkin bread. He spoke at the weekly meeting. I sat on the front row, and I was like, he's beautiful. And he's going bald, this is of God, because I never thought at 21 years old, I'm gonna like think a bald guy is beautiful. So yeah, that was my deep thought moment with Lisa. <laughs> so that's where I met Dennis. And uh, how long before you end up be becoming really serious with Dennis? Um, Dennis and I just forged a really wonderful friendship, yeah. but I had a crush on him the whole time. But when I, on my 21st birthday, when I surrendered, Real guys were one of the addictions. I surrendered and I just told the Lord, I, I am going to surrender this year to you to break this idol out of me. Like, just break me free where you will be my center, where my identity will be found in no one but you. And so that was the desire of my heart and I had a crush on him. So I was praying that God would bring us into a relationship. So anyway, it was just a very carefree we started country swing dancing together with a bunch of students and staff who were involved in the ministry mm -hmm. every Thursday night. And we were like uh, really good dancers. So anyway, there was an attraction, but it was a year before Dennis really, he had moved toward me a bit, but he wanted to wait for me to make the move to join staff with Campus Crusade mm. before he wanted to pursue me because he wanted, and I don't think he could have articulated all that, but he was very cautious. Plus, I'm 10 years younger. He's the campus director. I am this baby Christian. Like, there were a lot of odds stacked against us. So in his wisdom, he yeah. was very conservative. But it was really only a year. And when I took my staff interview with crew, then Dennis was like, <laughs> in for the kill. <laughs> so. I, I know I had... I ran across a phrase or uh, letters that I'd never heard before, the DTR. Oh, define the relationship, define. yes. And he posed that to you, right? Yes. He says, we need to have a DTR. Yeah. Did you know that what was, it meant when No, you, when I was said choking it? on pretzels when he said that. I'm like, this could be life-changing. I have no <laughs> idea what it is. You've got this yes. crush on Dennis, and, yes. and he needs a DTR. Yeah. So he had a crush on me, but he wasn't bold enough to really move on it yet. Uh -huh. But he was communicating, yeah. And did you, so then you guys eventually, of course, marry? Yes. Is we there... were engaged six weeks after he initiated with me, after I'd taken my staff interview. A year, a year or so. Huh? So we had become really good friends, and then we got married five months later. Now, where's family at this point? Have you shared with them? I know you, you eventually go to them and, and have a meeting with oh. mom and dad. Well, my 21st birthday happened. Right. And that morning after when I just experienced the freedom in my soul that I'd never known and a love for God that was so deep and a desire to be with people who knew this God, I got on a bus with a bunch of other college students from the University of Utah and who were with Crew. Now it's Crew, um, the ministry. Campus Crusade. Yeah, for it's called Crew now. Um, we went up to a Christmas conference in Portland, Oregon, and I told my parents, there's a bus from BYU going. There were like three students on it, but <laughs> there was a 
van and but that's when my parents knew there's something Some things. something's up and so you probably hadn't been going to church for no or were you always going no so you'd kind of, oh. i had stopped so going hint. in college they had a kind of a hint yeah the they knew thing. i was in a rebellion <laughs> definitely and i think they navigated that the best you can when your yeah. child is so rebellious right. um I think they worked really hard yeah. to stay in there with me the best they could. Uh, so, went to that Christmas conference, and Dr. Bill Bright, who is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, now crew, came and spoke, and he invited us to come help change the world. And something in me was so moved that I just knew I want to share this Jesus with anyone I can the rest of my life. And so, I would say that is when God called me or invited me to join the staff with crew in full-time ministry. Mm. And I was like, crud, now I need to tell my family I'm a Christian. And so that was just terrifying. And I came home and nobody would confront me. And I just wanted somebody to confront me, like, let's just get this over with. And so I set up an appointment with my parents to tell them. And we went to the Kyoto restaurant, <laughs> which was a little Japanese restaurant. Uh, and I been just, there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, I just thought, how can I somehow manage the explosion? And I was terrified. And we, we were having lunch. And at one point I just said, mom and dad, I need to share with you um, a little bit about what's happening in my life. And then eventually I said, I've placed my trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. And my mom gasped and just screamed, you've left us, you've left the family. And wept, yeah. like guttural weeping and terror. And then my dad started quoting scripture and, and it was most... I think it was like it's hard to remember leaving that restaurant because it was such an emotional it is so hard encounter. to share and like we said before it's you're all of a sudden bringing them all of this what you've been working on for months yes. and if not years and all right. of a sudden you're just laying it kind of on them and yes yeah it's it's yes. challenging and, yeah it would be brutal to not yeah. be along brought along in the process right so they've actually uh now we're um bringing it current but they've been very supportive i think we had a very tumultuous 18 months to two years. Did you? Very tumultuous. Were you finishing school at the University yes. of Utah? And, yep. Yeah. And lots of, it was just very, very, very difficult. And I lost my friends. From, Did you really? Yeah. And they, yeah, no one knew what to do with me. And so I was just all about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I remember sitting in one of my communications classes my senior year and this girl turns around and she's like, what do you eat for breakfast? And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> and it was true. Like I would read the book of Galatians start to finish every day before I left the house. I just had to have that feast of truth every morning to anchor me because yeah. that, that walk, that journey was so treacherous. Well, you mentioned that this was back in the 80s or so, and, and there was not the internet then, and people weren't leaving the church kind of like they are now. Right. And there wasn't a lot of resources, so you were you're quite courageous. I'm really proud of you for having that courage mm. to, to let Christ just, or Jesus just called to you. and. Mm -hmm. I and think the your... love of the biblical Jesus is so compelling yeah. that I couldn't stay. I could only follow him. And uh, again, the tension with family and, and so on is difficult. And you lost f friends, it sounds like. And um, when did, now, when did Dennis come? When did you finally get married then? How? So we married, uh, it was August, right after my senior year. Of, well, I, at of the college at the okay. U. So I was 22, he yeah. was 31. Oh. Yeah, and then we were on staff with crew another year at the University of Utah. How long have you been with them then? Now? 27 years. Wow. And what do you do? 
What kinds of things? Um, well, I'm a spiritual director, so I get to be a spiritual guide. And you go to different campuses? And... No, I'm not working with students anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. You did for a while? I, yes. Oh. I worked in the campus ministry for several years before I had my own kids. And then when I had my own, started having our own kids, I came home and I would do different jobs that weren't full-time. Oh. So that's one of the gifts of crew is that they really value giving moms the opportunity to stay home and yeah and you've had right five there. children we have five kids oh yep and are the, how are, are they older now and are they they're 23 the 22 <laughs> 18 17 and 15 oh my yeah that's a great group it is a great group yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so uh well we're going to probably talk more about your book in sure. in our next session but what uh did you what prompted you to write the book? Well, I never would have written this book had God not very clearly invaded my space <laughs> and invited me to write this book. I was sharing my story, a little 15-minute testimony at a church family camp six years ago. We had adopted our girls from Ethiopia a year earlier, and they were oh. 8 and 10. Mm. And that was quite a journey for all of us. And we were pretty much unraveled at the time, all of us, all seven of us. So it wasn't a season where I was feeling strong and bolstered and um, never would have thought about writing my story had not. Maybe when my family's gone. gone. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, this man came up to me after the meeting, after I'd shared my testimony, and he said, Lisa, have you ever thought about writing your story? Do you write like you speak? And I said, I just felt like he'd punch me in the gut. I was like, ugh. Don't, don't, I was don't like, Robert, that. you don't know what that would cost. I was like, maybe someday in the way distant future. And we had a conversation, and he asked me some unique questions, and I didn't know what he did. So I didn't know why he was asking me these interesting questions and like what book would you put in the hands of somebody who has a neighbor who's a Mormon or in a Mormon's hands and I was like I wouldn't I don't really have one for you and um, so anyway one thing led to another and he said do you know what I do and I said no <laughs> and he said I'm a literary agent and I said what's that <laughs> and he said it's like a realtor for writers yeah. And so a week later, we entered into a contract, and they basically coached me and were so patient. Normally, they said it takes people about a year to write their, liter or their um, proposal, their mm. publisher's proposal, and they coached me through that process. Well, because of my season of life and the post-adoption trauma we were all in, it took me five years and I bailed out several times, like for a year at a time, different things were you happening. Decide you wouldn't write it. I was like, and... the costs are too great. Yeah. No, what do you mean by costs would be too great? Because all of my family, except one brother and sister-in-law are still practicing Mormons. And I just have so appreciated how we have figured out how to navigate those waters so that we could be relationally harmonious. <laughs> And it's okay for me to talk about God and Jesus all I want, yeah. but I don't talk about Mormon doctrine. I haven't with them. Like that's just not been something that we do. And so I did not want to break that harmony. I liked being the good sister. I like being the good daughter. And so I just knew this is going to hurt people I love very much. Yeah. And it isn't it interesting that you have this heart to share, right. <laughs> and, but it's so difficult to share it with family and yes. friends. And, and it almost seems like, we say it all the time, elephant in the room yes. when you're together because you want to talk about Jesus and what he's done. And yet it's almost not a conversation that even LDS usually have. Mm -mm. They talk a lot about callings and who's going on missions and who's getting married in the temple and but they don't talk a lot about Jesus, do you think? Well, and it's in, I think most don't, or they'll say his name, but no. it's not the same kind of intimate relating that right. I experience and enjoy. But I would say my sisters have, um, I would say they are able to engage with me 
as I talk about the relational nature, like Jesus really? is just my best friend, yeah. and they're drawn to that. To that. Well, so you think they'll read the book? I have one sister who said she would like to read it. Now, this book just came out October 1st, right? It did. Yeah. It's a new so, release, and it's my first release. one. And you can get it on Amazon? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Christian Book. There's a lot. My website is lisabrockman.me, okay. M-E. M -E. <laughs> and they, that has all the links also. Okay. But, yeah, it's on Amazon. Well, I hope people will read it. I, I, I thought it was such a good read in the sense of uh, explaining a lot of Mormon doctrine and practices. Mm -hmm. You go through a lot of different things. And uh, I think for a Christian to read it, uh, exposed to Mormonism, that they would learn a lot, get yes. a lot out of it. Yeah, I wanted, to inv I wanted to give a window into the culture of Mormonism as well as the doctrine because the culture is so critical to understand if you're going to engage very successfully in mm -hmm. conversation with Mormons about doctrine. Well, and it's, uh, you were mentioning, um, or maybe we didn't exactly mention this, but just defining the words, mm -hmm. you know, eternal life and exaltation and yes. resurrection and being saved and all those things, what those mean in different yeah. to a Mormon compared to a, a Christian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, we're going to do this uh, one more, if that's okay. Oh, that'd be Can great. Can we do that and sure. get a little more into the book and so on? And so we'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files. <laughs>